Good afternoon, everyone. It is so wonderful to see so many students and alumni and community members here. It's just really a good day. Uh, this is an important conversation that we're going to be having today. It's exciting. Um, I am Brooke Carrington. I represent the Eccles Alumni Network. We are the alumni board for the David Eccles School of Business. And I am one of the co-chairs of the Alumni Outreach Board uh, Committee. And we are responsible for organizing the speaker series that uh, we are here for today and also some other events like the tailgate, the alumni tailgate that will take place next month. Thank you to Dean Randall for his enthusiastic support of what we uh, seek to do here. Thank you very much. And then also uh, a heartfelt thank you to Tracy McKellar who has, she's the nuts and bolts behind this. She has worked tirelessly to, to make sure that we're here and in good shape. I would like to introduce our moderator and our panel. I'll give you a, just a brief introduction, but then let them um, continue the conversation. This is our esteemed moderator, Kennedy Luvai. He is an attorney at Parsons Bailey and Latimer. He is part of the digital currency and um, blockchain groups there. He's very knowledgeable about the applications for blockchain, the capability, and the entrepreneurship and investment that is currently going on in that space. Um, he will be our moderator, our panelists. We have Josh McGyver. He is the founder and CEO of um, Uledger. And they are um, a, a blockchain application for the enterprise. Uh, next to him, we have John Richards. He is the co-founder and CEO of Dif Diffuon. Yes. And they um, have an application for the FOG. So it's a, a taking the centralized application in the cloud and transforming it to a decentralized application for the fog, so closer to the data. And then on the end, we have Todd Crossland, and he is the founder and CEO of CoinZoom, and they are a global digital currency exchange brokerage. So with that, I'll turn the time over to, to Kennedy. We're going to have about 35 or 40 minutes of presentation and discussion, and that will follow by about 20 minutes of Q&A. Thank you, Brooke. Uh, thank you, Tracy, and thank you all for um, taking the time to spend with us this afternoon uh, to talk a little bit about blockchain. Um, and before I kick off the discussion, just so that we have uh, a rough idea of, of the audience we'll be speaking to, uh, I'm just going to pose a, a few uh, questions. Um, how many of you um, are involved in any blockchain enterprises uh, startups, companies, or anything like that, just by, by raise of hands. All right, that's good. Um, how many of you um, hold cryptocurrencies, invest in cryptocurrencies, or uh, similar activities? All right, what's well, uh, that's, that's, that, that's good to know. Um, and so I think. Um, what we'll be doing this afternoon is, is hopefully having a, a 30,000 foot uh, discussion about blockchain and its applications, uh, which are pretty broad as, as the theme of the, uh, of the presentation um, suggests, uh, and which, is, which I subscribe to. Um, and so I think uh, just to get things rolling, um, since it, it, it appears that um, you know, there's people of, of kind of varied experience and exposure to, to blockchain. Um, Josh, um, what's your kind of 30 second, one minute elevator uh, description of what blockchain is to someone who's not as steeped in the technology as you are? Uh, yeah, 30 seconds. Um, for me, blockchain is a way to prove the truth of a certain transaction or, or data, whether that transaction is a cryptocurrency or is a contract. Blockchain is a trustless ecosystem where you don't have one central authority um, that you have to trust to authenticate something, anything. Blockchain takes that trust away and it mathematically proves uh, an event. That's how I would explain it. Explain it. And John and Todd, any, any other thoughts in terms of kind of a brief description? Yeah, about so what I, I, in, to this crowd, especially affiliated with business school, I assume here, and uh, alumni, the 
blockchain technology is really important. Don't let cryptocurrency and its ups and downs and favor or disfavor impact the actual importance of blockchain technology. And what I like to say, building on top of this comment, is that the language of business is what? Accounting. You've heard the accountants say that. They love to say that, right? The language of business accounting. Matter of fact, if you look back at human history, it was the advent of accounting that started creating wealth and people could accumulate wealth and prosperity until we could account for it and keep a paper record. They did it on metal and stone, and then they got paper invented, and they were able to do single-entry accounting. Then in the Renaissance period, approximately, double entry accounting where you could actually go back and audit and look back at transactions and records of who transacted with whom and exchanged what and who owned what. The problem is, is you could still cook the books and if the auditors weren't honest, but double entry accounting is what we have till this day and it's how the world runs to see who transacts with whom and who owns what assets. Blockchain technology is creating a triple entry accounting system where we don't have to trust humans in order to know who transacted and with how much and who owns what assets, that we can actually keep a record of it that's immutable and you can't game it or commit fraud on it at its base level, which is, has huge far-reaching implications across many, many sectors and industries in the economy. That was longer than 30 seconds. Go ahead. <laughs> So uh, I'll just add that you know blockchain is, in my experience, and and you know traveling the globe and meeting with with banks and other fi financial institutions, it's it's definitely uh, disrupting fintech globally. And maybe since the internet, blockchain, you know whether you know institutions or brokerage firms or banks are subscribing to say Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies, uh, they're all pretty much in agreement that the blockchain is definitely disrupting fintech and they're all figuring out a way to incorporate its merits into their systems. All right. And so um, just a little bit more in terms of um, your respective backgrounds, um, how did you stumble upon blockchain and what made it a technology um, where you felt you could either invest or build a company around? And I'll just start with Josh and go down the line. Yeah, um, <clears throat> it was a little bit serendipitous that John was talking about accounting because that's where I started my career. I started um, as an auditor for Deloitte. And um, as I'm sure this crowd knows, as an auditor, you, you go into a, a company, they pay you a lot of money to go in there, look at their data, and ultimately write an opinion as to the integrity of that data, the accuracy of the systems, the financials, etc. cetera. Um, there's a science uh, there, a, a very thorough science, but at the end of the day, it's, it's subjective, uh, right? Um, so fast forward a couple years, um, got my MBA, worked in private equity, and then I was working for a tech startup in, um, in Provo that John was actually involved with as well, looking to build a reputation economy platform. It's kind of a mouth, mouthful, but to do that, they, they were going to use blockchain. Um, now, when I learned about the technology, I, I immediately went back to my, my audit days at Deloitte and but you know, enterprises could really use this, especially from an auditor perspective, so they could have this mathematical proof of events. Um, an opinion doesn't become subjective all of a sudden, it becomes a fact, a trustless fact. Um, so long story short, we, we looked at the, the blockchain platforms out there, and the uh, first blockchain platforms were built for cryptocurrencies. Um, and they can handle maybe seven, 10, transactions per second, but when you think about an enterprise, they're, they're looking at thousands or even millions of transactions per second, um, depending on the, the business. Um, and so we, we looked at the blockchain platforms out there, and there really wasn't one that was built for the enterprise. Um, and so we we're, were crazy, and we said, well, let's, let's go out and build an uh, enterprise blockchain platform. And we did that, and uh, some of our clients now include Deloitte and Marisource Bergen and Thomson Reuters and uh, but like like Todd said, the enterprise world, the business world, is really starting to to grasp onto this technology. 
So I'm a tech entrepreneur that uh, an investor. So I had a company go public in the 90s, moved to Utah in 2002 to be a professor of entrepreneurship at BYU. Sorry. Okay, and um, did that for 12 years. Uh, uh, super involved in angel investing in the venture world. I've done around 80 direct angel investments. One of them was in a, this company that Josh just talked about. I was an investor and advisory board member there, and they were real early with a blockchain solution to a problem and got exposed to it there. They had a world-class team, one of them being Josh, real early, almost too early. And though that team disbanded because it was a little ahead of the curve, but really world-class. And one of those is my co-founder in the company, Defuon. About two years ago, I said, I better understand this stuff better. It took me 60 to 90 days, and I'm not stupid, but 60 to 90 days to really study and understand what it means to be an immutable ledger, what blockchain means, what distributed consensus means. These are all key terms around blockchain technology. And after about 60, 90 days, I actually got worried what China and other countries were going to do to this because it has the potential to disrupt governments in major ways if run amok. And people that bankers make $3 trillion a year in the $25 trillion economy because we don't trust each other just to take money because we have to go through the banks, right? And they don't want to give up that money and power very easily. And blockchain threatens a lot of that in the fintech world. And so I go, wow, this is interesting. But then I got together with one of these guys, cool guys, tech guys from this company. And he was working on reputation with consensus which consensus was founded by the founder of Ethereum, a major platform in the blockchain world. And we, he had another idea, and we decided to run with it. So it's really fascinating. There's the potential to disrupt um, a major piece of the world, which is today Amazon, Google Cloud, and um, Microsoft Azure dominate computing. It's massive. Matter of fact, Jeff Bezos has become the richest man in history, not just because of e-commerce, but largely also because he dominates the computing world. Fortune 100 companies, 80 of them went down a year or two ago when Amazon went down for two hours, and it cost some of them $160,000 a second when Amazon went down. And it was it's a major piece of the world right now. And what we're doing is saying we're going to demonetize that centralized server world in the cloud. Things are too centralized in the cloud, creates a lot of security risk. It takes away a lot of privacy and put it down in what's called the fog or the edge computing world, if any of you have heard that. And to do that, we need blockchain technology to federate the matching of producers and consumers in the network in nano transactions. And with blockchain technology, we can do nano transactions profitably, and it can be federated by artificial intelligence using blockchain to track it all and keep everything straight. That's significant. This could have never been done without blockchain and, and where things have come technologically. But basically, what it's going to mean is all of you can share in that revenue with, that Amazon now gets. We can distribute it across individuals and organizations and share in that computing revenue. It's pretty game changing. We'll see how it goes. It's a big deal. So um, a little bit of my background. I was at the the U before all of this took place. This is really amazing what's happened. Uh, but my experience in the uh, brokerage firm business uh, started back in 2000 with a company called Interbank FX that we founded. So it was a futures and commodities brokerage firm. Uh, we grew it to, we had offices in six countries, about a quarter million customers, and our firm was tra transacting about $70 billion a month in trading volume. Um, so. Uh, as we grew the business, about half the business was retail and half was institutional customers from around the world. And we sold the firm in 2012. Uh, since then, we've, we've started a, a broker dealer here in Salt Lake. And then as uh, my, my son Ben graduated uh, from BYU, sorry, <laughs> uh, this last year, um, uh, as you know, kind of the target market for cryptocurrency investing. We, we, we got talking and we were both, you know, buying and selling Bitcoin, Ethereum and really terrible experience, like trying to get money into the firm, trying to get money out. Uh, trades take a long time. 
we just kept thinking, geez, we really had this wired with our old company. Um, and so what we've done is we've kind of gathered uh, the team that we had at Interbank uh, with our chief compliance officer and chief uh, technology officer uh, and other people to, to build kind of the state-of-the-art cryptocurrency exchange. So our technology now, we can trade about 10 million trades a second. Um, so all of you can trade at the same time. Um, uh, but then we, uh, part of the, the solution is not only having, you know, great technology for trading, but also to provide liquidity to OTC desks and, and other institutional investors that are getting into the market. And, and we're in the process of, you know, it's a highly regulated space. So you're probably the winner in this room, Kennedy, as an attorney. So I think attorneys and compliance officers have, in this space, have a bright future. But we're, we're working through uh, licensing in the EU, licensing in Australia that we've just received, and then licensing in the US. And so we, we look to launch uh, probably around December. So. All right, and, and could you also talk a little bit about uh, CoinZoom Ventures and, and what you guys are doing in with that, with that entity? Sure, that, so that's a separate company um, that we, we just invest in uh, other, other technology uh, companies and we invested in a, in a blockchain company out of um, London that, that you know about, uh, Mainframe. And so we were, we were part of their seed round a couple of years ago and uh, um, they really hadn't had a lot of progress. It was gonna be a Slack uh, competitor and they, they pivoted, went into blockchain. Now they have uh, a, a really cool decentralized uh, anonymous messaging uh, application. And they, they raised $20 million recently in an ICO. And, you know, we get an email and you've got 10 million tokens, you know, in our ICO. And it's like, we, we didn't know about this, you know. So, so we learned a lot about it, you know, from from what mainframes experience too. So uh, not only with our exchange, but we look to invest in other uh, blockchain companies and probably more, um, more in the FinTech space that we're looking to invest in. All right. Um, and you all, you all have um, pretty deep and varied experience in terms of um, blockchain uh, and enterprises, kind of building them up and, and working with people in the space. Um, what are some of the um, kind of low-hanging uh, problems um, that blockchain solves um, just based on your experience? What are, what are some of the um, issues and problems that um, uh, are best addressed by blockchain um, given your respective experience? Yeah, so for us, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> again, we're, we're coming at this from the perspective of, of data integrity proving the integrity of a, of a transaction. Uh, so for us, the, the low-hanging fruit was actually email. Email is one of the most common ways in which we communicate in business. People make deals over email. People do a lot of things over email. Now, email is also most, one of the most risky ways to communicate. They can be deleted. They can be manipulated. They can, uh, you know, look at the whole Hillary Clinton email fiasco. There's just a lot of mystery around what could possibly happen to email. Um, so our very first product was using our blockchain for, uh, to integrate with an existing email platform, whether that's Google or, or Microsoft 365, what it is, whatever it is, you can aug augment your current email platform with blockchain and all of a sudden have this immutable record of all your emails, which becomes very usable um, for, or important for e-discovery or compliance, um, many, many reasons. Um, and we had a lot of success with that one. That was, that was the low-hanging fruit. From there, we, we grew to cybersecurity use cases, to accounting use cases. Um, but what's been interesting is that most companies find Uledger and want to build um, on our platform. They, they realize that the pi uh, other public and private blockchains out there don't do what they need them to do, and so they come build their entire company on, on Uledger's platform. So I, I think the, um, as I look at, uh, with our particular industry, it, it gets more back to the, the, the customer experience. And uh, so we're not a pure blockchain uh, 
um, play, but it's we're, we're trading blockchain assets. But really, you know, involving, you know, the best of breed, you know, technology, trading technology, you know, customer onboarding, doing the simple things that uh, uh, the customers, you know, when they want their money, they get it quick. And uh, those things, are, I think, are the low hanging fruit for us as we look at the competitive landscape. So I just generally think fintech, too, is the place where a lot of change is going to come. So financial technology, just blockchain, there's 20 different vertical things we could talk about just in that realm of which you have a part of. So I think that's a low hanging. Ours is a little more deep tech and what we're doing, so I wouldn't call it low hanging fruit, but it's made possible because the administration of networks, two-sided networks are going to be a huge part of the world going forward. They already are. We have a lot of two-sided networks that exist, but they're all centralized and controlled by a centralized company. Some of the largest, most powerful companies in the world right now have centralized control of massive networks. So the movement to decentralize these networks and federate the relationship between both sides of the network driving down the cost of transaction, the speed of transaction, and not having monopolistic tendencies with pricing. Um, for instance, just in the case of AWS, Amazon Web Services, which has been great. SaaS companies, computer companies can spin up servers, and it's easy to do, but truly putting everything in the cloud and centralizing it so much in almost a monopoly right now has also led to a lack of innovation. The last five, six, seven years has seen very little innovation in cloud computing services because that's what monopolies do. They release features slowly and milk them for the most money possible because of their monopoly power. And so what blockchain is allowing us to do is to decentralize networks. And that has a lot of ramifications. And we could talk for hours on that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and um, out there, it, so there's a lot of interest in terms of blockchain and, its, and other distributed ledger technologies and their potential impacts. Um, are there any use cases um, or applications or um, just discussions that, that you've come across where you're like, you know what, maybe blockchain is not an ideal solution for that problem? Is that? Do you have any thoughts on, yeah. on that? I'm an active angel investor. I do about six investments a year here in Utah. And um, I have seen the last two years massive numbers of entrepreneurs trying to retrofit blockchain into their business model in order to pull off an ICO. Um, in the last three, four months, though, the ICO market has tanked and is in a crypto winter, as they're calling it. And... Um, and all the late people to the party are having a very hard time doing that, and it's not working. And there's, I've seen countless deals in Utah where blockchain's unnecessary, but trying to be forced into a business model. And that, those are kind of a joke. You know, we, there's a lot of them, and we see those. And so, and, and they're not going to work. And but. A lot of the ones from 2017 that raised 20, 40, 60, 100 million dollars are also not working. The tokenomics behind them and, uh, and the purpose of blockchain was not correct and proper. And we're seeing a lot of that come home to roost now. But this is, I, I, I'll just share this one thing. Have you all seen the Gartner hype cycle before? You know what I'm talking about with the Gartner hype cycle? We have a, uh, a, uh, a peak of inflated expectations with disruptive technology. And then it has, um, uh, it falls into a trough of disillusionment. So we think it's going to be everything. Then we think it's going to be nothing. And then it comes out of the trough into a slope of enlightenment and true productivity. And at an accelerated cycle, we're seeing that with blockchain. It happened with the internet. The dot-com era was peak of inflated expectations. 2001, everybody said the internet was stupid. And then all of a sudden, we had Google and all these other companies emerge out of that and truly be productive and change the world. You're going to see that in blockchain. So right now is kind of a trough of disillusionment a little bit. I've been to eight conferences in the last 60 days, and it's pretty bleak at some of the blockchain conferences, to be honest with you, because um, they're the pump and dump mentality behind blockchain has died. And people that were making lots of money from pumping and dumping illegal securities <laughs> uh, um, are not liking that they can't make that same money anymore. So we're going to see what happens now 
when we get into real business and real solutions. And that's where you're going to have the opportunity to get involved with the next Google or the next whatever. Hey, Josh, Todd, any thoughts on as I As I look at that, um, you know, one of the areas that we've looked at in this space is, uh, you know, there's, there's exchanges around the world that, you know, are running from regulators and, you know, looking at jurisdictions where they don't have to be, you know, registered. And we've taken the opposite approach uh, to, you know, speak with the regulators. We've had, you know, a dozen meetings with the SEC and FINRA for, um, we, we, we trade, we're going to trade uh, cryptocurrencies, but we're also going to trade security tokens uh, through our broker dealer. So uh, I think going into the front door with the regulators, explaining our technology and, and how uh, using a security token as opposed to, you know, a share of stock, it, it, that can truly disrupt um, all areas of, of fintech for, you know, anybody that has a, uh, a cap table with a small startup, you know, that they could be issuing a security token as opposed to shares, and and there could be a place. Uh, we hope it's our exchange that they're traded. And what's what's the advantage of a security token versus equity or shares? Well, um, so uh, there's there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of unique advantages. Uh, you can build things into a security token. You know, so, you know, one of the, you know, easy things would be, you know, the 24-hour, you know, trading for the token once it's listed. Um, even if you have, you know, stock options in a, in a company, one of the startups that John invests in, you know, what if the employees got, you know, security tokens that vest over time, but they get listed on an exchange and they, they have liquidity and they're not waiting for, you know, Uber or Airbnb to do a, an IPO after 10 or 15 years, they can create liquidity for early investors and for, uh, you know, employees as well. Yeah, I mean, liquidity is the real answer, yeah. right? Because you buy a share of stock in a private company, the average tech company takes 8.2 years to get liquid. And this would allow immediate liquidity for investors and employees, potentially, if it goes through. If you're one of the first approved security token exchanges, that's going to be gargantuan. And that's what you're aiming to do, correct? Yeah. And so any timing on that? <laughs> we have to call Washington. No, but we're, uh, we're uh, it, it's not a, a binary option, you know, up or down. It's, it's just, uh, it's, it's control, custody, and clearing, uh, working with the SEC and FINRA for the regulators. And we have a nice solution for that. And so we're hoping, you know, by the end of the year, we'll have some really clear direction there. Just to build on this for, I think people always want to hear a little bit about cryptocurrency. At the last 60 days, what I've heard is with Bitcoin and Ethereum, so the two leading coins. So Bitcoin is hovering right around a stable. They're trying to hold its own. What everybody's waiting for is the decision on ETFs. They now, they allowed the futures, um, but if they can make the, retail market have an ETF. If they approve, uh, who, who are the Facebook guys, what are their names, the twins? Winklevoss. They have Winklevoss twins or ProShares, the two ones that have asked to do an ETF for Bitcoin. If one of those gets approved, so I, a lot of the people in the industry have told me they think Bitcoin will go to 20, 30,000. It'll be a really strong upward tick if that gets approved. They turned it down about a month ago, but I heard recently they said they were gonna review that decision and maybe reconsider. Um, so if the SEC approves an ETF in Bitcoin, that's going to be huge. Ether's got problems right now. Um, EOS raised $4 billion, which is probably only worth about $1.5 billion now because they kept it in Ether. And it is a, supposedly a better platform for smart contracts and other things than Ethereum. So I used to love Ethereum, but now I'm staying out of it because it's got true business competitive pressure. Besides the digital currency piece mm -hmm. of it, it's also got pressure as a platform. And um, a lot, it, it's too slow, too expensive for what it does. And there's other competitors that are better. So that's why Ethereum, everybody said if Ethereum drops below 200, that's going to be a problem. And it's below 200. So anyway, that's kind of what I hear in, at the conferences. So that's good. Yeah, thanks, thanks for that uh, perspective. Um, so we talked about, uh, Josh, with, uh, your work with Uledger, uh, John, your work with Daifuan. 
and Todd, your investment with mainframe, you ledger kind of being in the data integrity uh, space, generally speaking, Defuon being in the um, decentralized fog and mainframe being a um, uh, secure mes messaging app, and I think they're also doing other things as well. Um, just in terms of blockchain's broad reach, what are some of the um, other blockchain applications that um, you guys are tracking that you feel um, may have some pretty uh, far-reaching impact on business, on government, on um, other aspects of, of, of life, I guess? You know, I'll take this really quick, at least I'll start. Um, has anybody here followed Estonia at all? So Estonia has done a tremendous job of not only adopting new technology and implementing it into their infrastructure, but they're very um, progressive on, on blockchain. And they have implemented blockchain within their government, within their financial system, um, in ways that add real impact. You know, for them, it's not just a buzzword. They saw the, the um, efficacy of it very quickly and it's had huge impacts on their, on their, um, their entire infrastructure. But there, there are a lot of projects out there. Um, to kind of piggyback on your, on your last question, um, I think some of the good projects get lost because there are so many bad projects out there. Um, you start to get people that are skeptical of blockchain. Um, you know, first they'll say, well, well, blockchain, that's cryptocurrency, or blockchain, that's ICO. And both of those have kind of negative connotations because people have been ripped off or they've heard about ripoffs. And so um, when you do have a real uh, project, like what these guys are doing, um, that has legs, sometimes they get lost in all the noise. Um, and then you have the, the true blockchain believers um, and the tech people that get very interested in the tech behind blockchain rather than the actual usefulness of that technology. So it could be a beautiful technology and do really cool things, but at the end of the day, it doesn't do anything that's, that's impactful. Um, so there's a lot of noise, um, but if, if you're looking at the space um, in terms of adopting it or investing, um, you do have to do your homework. I mean, there have been so many ripoffs, and there are, uh, there are more and more companies that have real projects, and you can, kind of, you can kind of see by whether they have revenue and traction and sophisticated investors, because um, you, you know, sophisticated investors, uh, like John here, he's, he's looked at a dozen different projects in the last year. Um, have you invested in, in any of those blockchain projects? Um, not in the last year. Right, they're, they're very hard to find. Um, so that, that's what I would add. So uh, Utah's home to a great project, which is Evernim Sovereign Platform. So here in Utah, um, there was a company called Evernim, and uh, my co-founder actually got with them uh, and before we started Defuon and helped them devise a solution for one of the major problems on the internet. The internet has a problem because it would, did not bake into the protocols uh, of the internet identity and reputation. So that's why this company before is working on reputation. But to solve reputation, you have to solve identity. That's the base thing that needs to be solved. We have to be able to know that a piece of data is really what it says it is and that a person acting in the digital world is really who they say they are. The anonymity on the internet has caused massive problems for the last 25 years. So what blockchain promises is the ability to potentially have self-sovereign identity where you actually own and control your identity. And it can't be co-opted, it can't be stolen by someone else and used for something else. And you can be known but still have privacy. And it's really interesting concept, self-sovereign identity. And so this company, Evernim, has created uh, and donated it to the world called Sovereign, S-O-V-R-I-N dot org, talks all about it. And it was just recognized this summer as there were three competing solutions for this, but it was called out as the best solution by the European Union. Uh, GDPR, is that the name of their privacy thing? The only one compliant was the one here out of Utah, and now something like uh, 20 major corporations last 60 days have said they're adopting and going to use Sovereign as their base identity solution. This is huge for Utah and just huge for solving the problem of identity. And for instance, Defuon needs to solve for identity, and we will be using that technology 
for our identity needs because it's important. And so it's kind of interesting to see those things coming out of Utah. And uh, Silicon Slopes and other organizations are trying to make Utah a real bastion of blockchain, technolo blockchain technology, which I think you're involved in, Kennedy. Yeah. Oops. And Todd, um, any blockchain applications out there that uh, you're excited about? Well, I, I think, you know, so we have a centralized exchange for, uh, a, you know, an order book. So we have, a, you know, orders from all over, you know, customers all over the world uh, that we can trade with. But we're, we're looking at adding a, an additional feature for a decentralized exchange uh, where it would be, you know, you, you el eliminate the middleman, so to speak, but we charge a, a small fee for that. But you're really transacting, you know, one-on-one -on -one with a customer in Brazil or, or in Germany. Say so. We we think that that's an interesting application for blockchain going forward as well. All right. I, th I think voting is yeah. also another one. I'd like. I I'm just as a citizen. You know, I worry when I read that even in the United States in 2018 we have voter fraud going on, which is kind of amazing to think about, right? That somebody could stuff ballot boxes and it actually works or manipulate the voting results. And blockchain, well, like what Estonia is doing, right, has the potential to completely eliminate all of that and have complete integrity. It's kind of funny to say it. It's a trustless environment because trust is not needed for there still to be integrity, which is a fascinating way to look at things. And that's kind of exciting. All right. And then um, so just one more question before I open it up to the audience. I'm sure there's um, questions bubbling up as we speak. Um, we talked about um, the, the crypto winter, the um, kind of downturn in terms of um, uh, cryptocurrency investments and that's potentially impacting how much uh, funds may be available uh, to be invested in some of these blockchain projects. Um, what are some of the other challenges um, that you've faced either personally or that you've seen um, that entrepreneurs and founders and, and uh, CEOs in blockchain companies um, experience as they're building and scaling their projects? So the biggest one is technology expertise and competent mm -hmm software engineers. Um, blockchain technology is a return. The pendulum swings in tech about every 10, 20 years. The, la the cloud and the last 15, 20 years has created software engineers that do very easy programming and very front end kind of superficial work. Blockchain actually requires engineers that are deep tech and back end coders that have to work in databases and understand technology that was actually needed 20, 25 years ago more. And so it's kind of funny, there's a lot of 45 to 55 year olds that are really good at blockchain because the 25 to 35 year old did not learn enough deep tech coding to really do some of the work required to be like the lead engineer at a new blockchain startup. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And this has created interesting dilemmas because those guys are really expensive. I mean, literally, they can make $20,000 a month at the drop of a hat as a salary, and you're a startup trying to hire them. That is hard. And that's the biggest problem as a founder of a startup blockchain company that immediately hits me in the face. Like right now, I want to hire three to 10, and I can't even find hardly any. I would, I would add to what John said, and then I would also add the regulatory environment um, has been a hurdle for us. Because you have companies outside the US who don't have the same regulatory restrictions, um, which can be bad, obviously. There, there definitely needs to be regulation. But in the US, we're not playing by the same rules as, as, company, or as companies in other countries. You can go out and, and do an ICO in Singapore, and they don't care if it's a security or utility. It doesn't matter. Um, and so they can go out and raise $10 million in a week and have a, this war chest to go out and hire developers and market and go to conferences and do all the things you need to do <clears throat> as a startup. Um, however, in the US, we, we have restrictions. If we want to do an ICO, um, if it's appropriate, we have to go set up a company in the Caymans or Estonia or some company. And, and that costs minimum $100,000 to do. Um, and people like, Kennedy make a lot of money off that, and they're, they're loving the regulatory environment. Um, 
but it, it, it makes it harder. Then, on top of that, you, you do have a bad taste in people's mouth from ICOs and from cryptocurrencies, and blockchain has kind of, kind of come become this word for, that you can do, every, it'll cure cancer, right? It, it can do everything. And um, there's a lot of education that, that takes place. For example, when we go to a, sorry about that. When we go to a CTO of a big enterprise, he will know somewhat about blockchain, but he may not know that there are both public blockchains and private blockchains. There are distributed ledger systems. There, there, it's a nuanced space, and so blockchain has become this word that is, uh, it is very, it's simplified the underlying technology. So educating people on that um, and, the, and the benefits of that is, is a struggle and an expensive one. Todd, any thoughts about challenges? Yeah, I would, I would echo regulators. Uh, so in the fintech space, and especially in you know, dealing with customer funds and in trading, uh, dealing with global regulators, you know, we're, we're regulated, approved now in about 25 of the 50 states. We're, we're going through that process, regulated in Australia, working on regulation in the EU, and uh, even in the U.S., uh, with, with our particular registration, uh, it's surprising, you know, when we registered as a broker-dealer, it's just one federal registration with the SEC and FINRA. Pretty straightforward if you've got, you know, the, the history and experience and capital. Uh, but in what we're doing, each state has a little bit different uh, flavors of what they're asking for, and so Ben's been really busy with you know with each of these states, and uh, it, it's amazing what what they're asking for to get you know approved and regulated there. But we're we're going through that process. But I think regulation is is definitely a hurdle. But I think it's also a, a, a double-edged sword. Once you are regulated, it creates barriers to entrance. Um, it, you know, you know, going through the front door with the regulators is definitely the right way to do it. So, all right. Well, we'll open it up for questions. Um, why don't we go then, and we'll, we'll get you next. Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Baker. Uh, thank you to the panel for uh, being here. Um, I just, I'm an associate general counsel uh, here in Utah, and I just started the executive MBA program. And I was so excited to see that this would be uh, the first alumni lunch that I could go to, because by coincidence, uh, four or five years ago, when I was still in law school, I took an interest in watching the Bitcoin and saw no one was really writing about it. Certainly no one had written about it. Uh, the legal regulations, so I decided uh, why not have a law student do it and published it on uh, Amazon. But one thing that four or five years ago was really a big topic was people were saying, oh, blockchain is going to be co-opted by banks or by other platforms, and, but it was still so far away. And now I've noticed the last six months everywhere uh, there's these new applications, and I'm especially interested in um, companies like IBM trying to sell solutions that say you can verify even your supply chain for your products using blockchain. And that's just something, even with my background, that I have conceptually a hard time understanding with, especially if your supply chain is down to the commodity or you're growing something. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit about if you had uh, any exposure to uh, supply chain solutions or blockchain. So we, we have a client, um, a client called Amerisource Bergen. They're a Fortune 12 pharmaceutical supply chain company. And and uh, I'll, I'll get to how they use us, but let me, you brought up IBM, and IBM drives me crazy. Are there any IBM people in here? <laughs> um, you know, in, in our opinion, they've kind of given blockchain a little bit of a bad name because they use the technology as a way to get their foot into the door and then sell their cloud services and their hardware and consulting. And their blockchain technology, if you look under the hood, it's not, it's not good. And they make all these promises, like addressing certain use cases that... Um, just aren't realistic. Um, but yeah, we, um, we have a, a client, Amerisource Bergen, who uses um, uh, U-Ledger to have a real-time, authenticated, time-stamped record of where their assets are at a certain point in time. Um, so it's not, uh, you know, there aren't smart contracts involved. It's kind of the very low-hanging fruit of using the technology to authenticate where your assets are at a certain point of time and communicate that across their, across their infrastructure. Um, beyond that, we have uh, supply chain companies that don't use us for supply chain use cases, but rather um, cybersecurity use cases. So, there's at least ten meetups in Utah here, 
probably between here and Lehigh that happen weekly or monthly. And last night was specifically the blockchain supply chain meetup. I don't know if you've attended that or did you go? I was going to go and I didn't go last night, but that it was and it had a leading supply chain company and what they're doing in blockchain. All the, it, there's literally a specific meetup where scores of people attend to talk about just that. So you should know about that and maybe participate in that. Uh, just a word on IBM too. I, I view IBM, IBM of one of the large players, they completely missed the boat on the cloud. And they're very disturbed by that because they could have been a major player. I mean, it's AWS, Azure, Google Cloud, and IBM is a non-player. And I think they're using blockchain to get the foot in the door to resurrect what they lost in the last 15, 20 years. And that's what they're trying to do. And I think it's what you mentioned, which maybe is an old another discussion, but the difference between private and public blockchain, right, is at the heart of that. So a private blockchain is not very decentralized as a business. A public blockchain is. Do you agree with that statement? Absolutely. And that, that's what you're saying about IBM, right? Yeah. yeah well said. Question for broader both. My name is uh, Craig Irvine. I'm an underwriting at Century Financial here in Salt Lake. My my broad. I don't. I can. I can hear. Can you hear me in the back? We have the video. I hate microphones. Okay. <laughs> um, my question goes into this. I think there's pretty universal consensus that once a piece of information, whether it's a transaction or other piece of information, is in the is in a blockchain, it's very secure. However, that always raises the question, and I'd love to hear your perspectives on how to vet the information going into the blockchain. Um, especially as we get more and more use cases, more and more apps to use different types of information. I'm just curious to hear your, you know, any of your thoughts about how that vetting is, could, would be, will be done. Yeah, yeah, so I'll start with that. You know, like anything, um, garbage in is garbage out. Um, you, you can't authenticate um, something going into the blockchain. What the blockchain does is it authenticates that piece of information once it's once it's there. From there, it takes forensics people to say, okay, well, this is what they say. Now, let me, let me prove that. But I, we get that question all the time. And, and kind of the consensus in the community is that it's not blockchain's job to um, confirm the integrity of data going in, because that would be a very hard job to do mathematically. Um, but once it's in there, then yeah, it does a very good job of certifying the truth of that transaction. Would you guys agree with that? Yeah, I would just say, though, but distributed consensus it prohibits fraud, you you know, a fraudulent transaction like in a fintech arena. But you're just saying if somebody puts in data that's bad from the start and is erroneous, but if you're trying to manipulate and commit a fraud in the blockchain, distributed consensus is the safeguard for that because of the computing power you would need to to control more than 50% of a network. That's the concept behind it. That's, I don't know, that's how I understand it. But if you're asking about just that it was an error in a piece of data and it got into there. I don't know, how, that's whatever we put into a database is what it is. But if you're trying to commit a fraud with it, that's where you, you can't, that's where there's good safe controls for that, my understanding. So the presumption would be that, that once in there, that the conglomeration of data around that same concept, that, that would be identified Well, I'm not gonna, I'm not a technologist. I wish I had my partner here to answer that question. But a two-sided transaction, having the entire network approve that that transaction, that both parties are who they say they are, and that the transaction is legitimate, it requires greater than 50% approval. Right, oh, and you would have to override more than fifty. Like right now, to commit a fraud just by a, a fraudulent transaction on Bitcoin would require more than I've heard f the po computing power of five hundred Google companies, which doesn't exist. Right, so very hard to do a f committing a fraudulent transaction to double spend in a transaction. For instance, I spent this asset or money and I'm going to spend it again with another person over here and use it twice. That would be a fraudulent transaction. And that is what blockchain is very good at stopping. But the 
fact that like let's take the genealogical databases of ancestry and things like that if somebody puts in the wrong birth year for a person and that data got put in by a person could that propagate through the system as an erroneous date i'm sure it could right because the integrity of that piece of data is not being checked by a blockchain process That's, yeah, that's, that's a really good point, good question, which is one of the reasons um, private blockchains can be dangerous. They're, private blockchains are not a trustless system. You have to trust that the person who runs that blockchain and governments, um, you know, like I, I imagine China, if they go this route, are going to want a, a private government controlled blockchain. Um, and, and IBM and other companies, uh, enterprise companies especially, have kind of gone the private blockchain route because they can handle a lot more data throughput, but they completely lose that public consensus of the data and, and the trustless ecosystem. Um, but yeah, yeah, and, and that's why we preach against private blockchains. No, you can't. Can I just take two second answer? For you reminded me of something that's exciting. Technology is the um, the world of uh, this. You know, two to four billion people in the world make very little money and transact in very small transactions. And the ACH and other um, transmission fees make it very hard for them to participate. First of all, they don't sometimes have the identity, and then the transactions are so small that the cost to do the transactions high. Blockchain and some of the technology being worked on are specifically addressing the micro entrepreneur, the entrepreneur that borrows $100 and turns it into $400 uh, through entrepreneurial activity, and how do they transact and move that money in PayPal is expensive to move that money and things like that. And so this, and just at Diffion, for instance, we're doing nano transactions. Literally what uh, is happening in our company is we're going to take an application that needs to run on a server, but now we're going to have it in a serverless environment, break the application down into its functions, which are pieces of an application, and run one function on this node, this function on that node in the same application. And those are nano transactions. Now, if we and that's a monetary transaction, if we had to pay what the banks and today's world wants, we couldn't afford. So by having the tokenomics in our company correct, we can have a dual token model and have a token that appreciates and is value like a security token, and we can have a medium of transaction token that we can run internally in our network with no cost to have people exchanging. And so there's a lot of things happening. I'm not an ac absolute expert on it, but there's a lot of promise to take care of micro and nano transactions and really drive the cost down so that they will work for billions of people in the world. I think I'll be dead before fiat currency changes very much. That's the real honest answer, because there's fiat currency is very important and it's still controlled, and that's at the heart of a lot of governments. But as far as within a network doing transactions that are very small at low cost, that's a big promise, I think. Do you agree? Absolutely. Yeah. So, so who's, uh, who's ever sent Ethereum or cryptocurrency to somebody, to a wallet? 
So it's a pretty cool experience um, versus, you know, going to the, you know, the bank or working with your bank or, or PayPal or... or like it, Venmo kind of. Yeah. It's, it, but better, even faster, right? But, but faster, you know, we, we, we have a small OTC desk now as we're getting launched and we did a transaction with a, a company in Hong Kong. It was a million dollar transaction they wanted to sell. The transfer to our BitGo wallet, which is a secure wallet that we use, uh, we transferred it to a, a OTC clearing desk in um, Chicago. Uh, we, we sold we sold the amount, and the wire was sent back to our our firm. I mean, and it all happened, you know, Hong Kong, our BitGo wallet in San Francisco, Chicago, wire back to us in like an hour. I mean, it's pretty amazing. You'd be hard pressed to do that through the regular system. So, well, I think uh, looks like we're um, out of time, but uh, I'm not sure about um, Josh, John, and Todd. But um, I'm sure there'll be an opportunity to um, reach out to them either right here or uh, at some other point down the line. Um, but just in the interest of time. Um, I think that's all we had, and um, I thank you all for, for being here, and uh, I think it was a pretty good discussion. Thank you. That's awesome. Thanks very much to our panel. Um, we are going, this is the kind of forward-looking conversation that I think uh, the internet and email was experiencing in the early 90s. So there will be more, uh, more discussion about property ownership, vehicle exchange, and things like that uh, with blockchain technology. Um, please get a fly flyer on your way out. This is our um, alumni tailgate that will be at the uh, Utah-Arizona game on October 12th. And then we are going to have a similar uh, discussion um, in February talking about the IPO journey. We'll have some U of U alums uh, here talking about their company's journey to uh, going public. And then also in April, we'll have something similar about strategy and mergers and acquisitions. So stay tuned for those. Thanks very much for coming. And thanks so much for our panel and moderator. Thank you. <laughs>